Hello. So today I wanted to talk to you a bit about this idea of information-centric thinking in a dynamic resource allocation. Uh, I'm Kong Xu from Stanford University, and this is part of Sigmetrics 2020, uh, since it's being held online. Now, first and foremost, I want to say a few acknowledgments and thank you, especially to the Sigmetrics community for this award. And I want to say special thanks to my PhD advisor, John Sisiklis, and undergraduate advisor, Bruce Hayek, for me the mentorship that set me on this path. And of course, my collaborators and students over the years, without whom um, the research would have not been available, uh, possible. All right, so jumping right in. So the outline for today um, is as follows. I will start with a somewhat of a personal reflection about what I noticed as a shift of focus from resource allocation to information. And in particular, I will propose a framework called information life cycle as a way to think of information as a central object in resource allocation problems. And to contextualize that and give some examples, I will give three, um, in fact, really three areas of personal research vignettes. Now, these are a bit short due to the time constraints. Um, so I will try to be uh, staying on the high level and not delving too much into mathematical details. And then finally, I want to share some reflections on is this view of information centric resource allocation all worth it? Now, disclaimer, I have to say that all the non theorem material in this talk will be mostly personal reflections, which means I do not make any claims as to how novel they are. And of course, I'm woefully missing um, essentially all of the references. So please bear with me. For the purpose of this talk, we can think of information as partial knowledge of some useful system input or state, for example, um, queuing length, queue lengths in a queuing system, or arrival rates uh, to a queuing system. Those can be information, and that's typically what we call real-time information. And other times we can look at predictive information, and these are information about the future, for example, predictions of future demand patterns or arrivals to a queuing system. Now, on the other hand, we have resource allocation. And to be a slightly more concrete, let's say these are problems having to do with assigning finite resources to achieve certain system-wide objective. So I'm sure for this community, people are fairly familiar with that. For example, we can think of the data centers and call centers who are allocating servers to process jobs or routing, where we're allocating link capacities to different information flows, or in crowdsourcing, we're allocating human capital, human capacity in labeling certain documents or images and so on. Now, if we look at information versus resource allocation, so let's step back a little bit. And here's a very, very rough historical perspective that I, I think of when I, when I think about the problem. Let's say a long, long time ago, uh, when people think about resource allocation, I would argue that problems back then were a bit more resource driven, namely system designers typically think about and think around physical resources such as mines, land, energy, factories, and so on. Uh, whoever controls such resources typically have the power, have the control of the system. Now, skills and information were relevant, but really not yet playing a central role. Now, post the computer age, let's say stretching from 1950s all the way into modern time, early 2000s, there has been a shift towards more information-driven decision-making. Now, what I mean by that is decision-making is increasingly powered by information and more informed by information. Examples include CRM, customer relationship management, fast fashion, you can think of Zara, adapting the fashion to the most um, recent feedback by the customers, dynamic scheduling and server farms, and in general, resource allocation just increasingly depend on information available. Now, looking forward a bit from 2020 onward, could we say that the future will be something called more information-centric decision-making? Now here, just information is going to shift from just being the uh, means to the end to actually become the end goal in and of itself. Now, for that, we can think about Google, for instance. So even more interestingly, we can think about the possible rolling version between information and physical resources. For example, if we think about companies like Tesla or Apple, are they really hardware companies that just use information? Or rather, they're really selling information, but with lots of hardware built around it. Now, this kind of train of thought was a backdrop with which I started today's talk, which is to think that 
how is such information central centrality reflected in our field, and specifically in the design of resource allocation systems? Should they be reflected? And if so, what are the opportunities? So delving a bit more into the details now, of course, there are many, many ways to articulate this question as far as what does it mean to be informationally centric? Here's one very concrete uh, framework that I've been exploring a bit in my research. And namely, I want to understand how to design resource allocation algorithms and systems to facilitate the generation, utilization, and protection of information. Now, specifically, these three components is about the birth, sort of life, and the death of information. And that's why we call it an information life cycle. Now, more specifically, under generation, one can think about how to best design and how to best generate information given finite processing resources. And the research vignette I will discuss later have, will have to do with the resource-constrained machine learning, crowdsourcing, and experimental design. Now, once information is generated, the next question could be, what is the fundamental utility of such information in the context of helping resource allocation run better? So here we'll look at the value of information in stochastic processing networks and scheduling. And finally, to the protection. This might be the least obvious one, which is how to prevent any unwanted outflow of information as we engage in resource allocation. And for application research, this typically has to do with a privacy-aware decision-making. And I will give you some example about privacy-aware routing just in a bit. So in what follows, I will delve into each of the three life cycles of information. Um, from a chronological perspective, actually, I started the journey first by thinking about the value of information. So I will start right there. Now, this is a chart, um, very rough chart. It's about when I think about information uh, in decision making, here's like a very high level uh, system diagram, which is in the middle, we have a resource allocation problem. And there's a decision maker in a gray box right there who exerts actions to the research, uh, resource allocation problem. And the decision maker receives some kind of input information either from the system state or directly getting knowledge about the input to the problem itself. Now, of course, the box on top has input. You can imagine some unprocessed jobs and have output, maybe some processed jobs. Uh, or just any uh, output uh, this we can consider. So in the first problem that we're going to look at, information comes in the form of knowledge about the input. And in particular, um, we looked at the following problem, which is actually a pretty classic problem in resource allocation called admission control. Here, you can look at a single queue with one server. Jobs arrive to the system stochastically. Admission control policy sits at the very beginning, uh, very front of the queue. And when each job arrives, um, a decision is made as to whether the job is admitted to the queue or is to be diverted. Now, due to capacity constraints, a fixed fraction of jobs must be diverted. So the goal of the designer is to figure out how do I do the diversion in such a way so as to minimize the waiting time experienced by the job inside the queue. and um, while not violating the diversion constraints. Application for this model is actually pretty wide, uh, pretty wide, including internet congestion control, healthcare, and so on and so forth. And the particular twist in the story is about information. So now we're going to assume that maybe thanks to certain predictive algorithm, future arrival times and server speeds in our system will be observable up to a finite look ahead window. And the question is, what does that do to our system? And how can we leverage information for better scheduling and better performance? So here's the result that we obtained. If we look at L as the length of that look ahead window, you can think of that as time. And let's look at the heavy traffic limit as the system low lambda goes to infinity. Um, in fact, so sorry, uh, as the heavy traffic limit as the lambda goes to one, namely the system is heavily loaded. Then there exists two constants, A and B, such that the following is true. First, if the look ahead window is sufficiently long, and in particular, longer than A times log one over 
one minus lambda. Then we see that the expected Q length in steady state will converge to, in fact, a constant in the heavy traffic limit. If on the other hand, L is short, and in particular, just slightly shorter than B times log one over one minus lambda, then the Q length not only does not converge to finite constant, but actually blows up uh, to infinity at roughly the same rate. It's always on the order of log one over one minus lambda. So to visualize this pictorially, we can see there's actually a fairly clear trade-off between the amount of information we have available on the x-axis and the delay or Q length the system must suffer. Whenever information exceeds this critical threshold of log one over one minus lambda, uh, we get extremely good performance. Whereas if the predictive information drops below that level, then it sort of doesn't matter how much information we really have. And you can see this kind of phenomenon in simulation as well. Here, the black curve is what you can get in the optimal online policy without knowing the future. Whereas the red curve is what you can get by knowing the future. And obviously there's a very, very drastic gap uh, between them on the order of a um, couple, maybe five times or two times, depending on what you're looking. Um, and later on, we actually extend this insight into a more practical control uh, policy applied to the emergency room. Here we can look at general arrival service patterns, or even when the prediction about the future is not perfect, but noisy. Um, but we can see that the improvement and quality of improvement still remains um, anywhere from 7% to 9%. So in the second vignette in the same, same category, we're looking at a slightly different form measure of information. Um, here we're measuring how much does the decision maker know about the system state. And um, in this paper actually appeared last year in Submetrics, we're looking at the following model, where a decision maker here represented by a receiver aims to control a queuing system. But unfortunately, the information about the queues and the state of the system is corrupted. It's not perfect. And in particular, it can be modeled by the information corruption through a Shannon channel. So here's the question. Well, if we know the imperfection of the channel, can we understand what fraction of capacity region we can retain what we lose as a function of the information and the memory of the system available? Now, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go into too much detail in this model, but um, our main findings um, are essentially a near complete characterization of such a capacity loss under a general channel and under general memory constraints. And a key insight that we discover is that in order to achieve the optimal capacity factor, um, one can actually use a family policies, which we call episodic max weight, which is a generalization of the um, famous max weight policy. And using that in the appropriate way, you can actually achieve optimal capacity under any information constraint and memory combinations. Okay, so that, that wraps up a bit on the utility side. So let's look at information generation. So here we're looking at the same system diagram, but now the focus is on the output of the resource allocation. And in particular, the thing that we output here will be information itself. Um, and back in 2008, we considered the following model, which is essentially a classification system, but with a finite processing capacity. So here, imagine there's a stream of unlabeled jobs arriving to the system. Uh, for now, you can imagine this is a stream of photos with a label unknown. And we're going to employ a class of a finite set of experts and servers to perform noisy inspections. So the, each expert might get a picture, and then in return, it will attack a noisy signal uh, to the picture that has to do with the label at hand. The resource constraints in the system are captured by the fact that, number one, there are only finite number of servers. And number two, each inspection will occupy that particular server for a fixed amount of time. And the application for such systems, typically from machine learning, where you might have a fixed number of servers in the server farm, crowdsourcing, you might have a fixed number of experts, or design experiments, where there's some capacity on the machine that will, prefer, uh, that will perform such experiments. Of it all, the central question in this model is to understand what is the maximum information processing capacity of a fixed set of servers. And namely, how do we even measure the maximum information outflow 
um, of a, a set of servers. And once we know that, how to extract such maximum capacity optimally using a suitable algorithm. Okay, so the, the result that we had was the following. In particular, we're interested in maximizing information output in this particular model, which means the number of label jobs per second subject to a certain accuracy constraint. That is, I want to make sure my probability of making a mistake on the label is suitably bounded. So here we can show that essentially under a very general setting that there exists a prior oblivious scheduling policy. Namely, it does not need to know the prior of each label such that as the error probability tends to zero, um, it will be able to deliver nearly optimal throughput. Meaning if lambda optimal is the maximum possible um, processing rate uh, of the system under any policy, then this particular policy will be able to achieve one minus little over one of that uh, in this regime. Now, if you want to be a bit more specific, here's the exact form of the little O1 factor, though it remains an open problem whether that can be improved. I want to highlight a little bit a key technique that enabled us to achieve this because it's relevant for our discussion. And namely, a driving force and a kind of workhorse for this algorithm is a notion of information workload. That is, we can view the system state as a certain vector of cumulative log likelihood ratios representing the designer's belief of the um, knowledge of the, all the jobs in some aggregate form. And once we understand that, we can actually use techniques developed in queuing system, uh, such as flu models, maxway policies, to understand how this particular information workflow evolves and using that to derive such optimal learning results. And finally, moving on to the realm of protection. What do we really mean by protecting information in the allocation sense? Well, here's a picture. So the same picture as before, but now we will assume that as the decision maker um, is making allocation decisions within the resource allocation problem, the actions they choose are actually in fact observable. Um, this can be through certain monitoring, or online um, data collection. And we'll assume that information eventually flows to some adversary who, are aiming, who is aiming to use such information to infer some hidden aspect of the system that the decision maker might not necessarily want to disclose. For instance, by observing these actions, can I guess the system state or can I guess the system input? Now, if this is indeed possible, our question will be how do we design the allocation policies as to prevent such adversarial learning? And what kind of price do we have to pay? A particular model we considered is in the context of routing. So here we're thinking about a very classic routing problem where a decision maker wants to send a parcel uh, from some point zero to a random recipient D, random from the perspective of outside, but not so random, in fact, observable from the sender. Now the route must include the destination D but does not necessarily have to end at D, for otherwise it will be too obvious. Now we assume there's some adversary who observed the entire route and wants to predict the recipient D. There is a resource constraint where we want to say the delay for reaching D under such a route must not be too long, or the total route length must be bounded. And that gives us some notion of a private routing policy, that is, a routing policy that minimizes the chance that an adversary can predict the goal D very accurately, subject to a delay constraint. Namely, we want to add some kind of randomness, some obfuscation to the choice of the route so as to make the recipient D uh, private and hidden. And a similar privacy framework can be and has been extended to studying sequential learning algorithms. I won't go into detail there, um, but um, references are attached. So what can we say about such a system? And here's the result. So if we fix an undirected network with diameter D, then we can show that for any delay budget W, the following is true. There, first of all, there exists a routing policy that achieves um, the following guarantee such that the adversary prediction accuracy cannot be more than two over W minus D. And conversely, under any routing strategy, there's always some adversary prediction that will achieve accuracy at least one over two W plus one. 
Now, taken together, this shows that there indeed is a fundamental information resource trade-off. And that is, the information leakage in this problem, as captured by the prediction probability, is on the order of 1 over the delay, namely 1 over the resource budget. So now we've seen some examples in the utilization, generation, and the protection of information. I want to share with you some closing thoughts. I guess maybe the most obvious question uh, one would have is whether such an information-centric framework of thinking is necessary at all. Namely, we have three different areas of focus. So why don't we study information generation, risk allocation, and privacy in separate frameworks or even separate communities? Now to that, um, my answer will be, I do think there is tremendous benefit to such a uh, information-centric framework of thinking. And here are some reasons as to why. Um, reason number one might be the most obvious one, which is modern applications are increasingly intertwined. Even though we did separate uh, the question into three different areas, most applications, in fact, intersect multiple stages of the information lifecycle, or even all of the stages. For instance, if you look at um, the recent um, interest in privacy-aware machine learning or federated learning, we're essentially dealing with a problem where we're trying to extract information while protecting privacy at the same time, a combination of the generation and protection in one model itself. And also, you can look at uh, modern algorithms for scheduling jobs in data centers. And oftentimes, those algorithms might rely on sophisticated machine learning algorithms to infer uh, the state of the queues which otherwise would have been too expensive to directly estimate. And therefore, in that system, it will be very fruitful to think about how to generate predictions, and along with how to use such predictions for decision-making in the subsequent steps. Reason number two, I would say, is on the methodological end. Namely, in fact, if sharing methodologies across these otherwise separate areas could lead to significant advances. Here's some early evidence. For instance, in our own work, we have been um, able to use ideas from queuing theory in designing machine learning algorithms, for instance, the information workload idea in the information processing system. And also, it's very easy to see that a few very important information theoretic tools, such as FANOS inequality, can play a very central role in understanding private resource allocation. And finally, in some recent work um, I did it with my colleague, Stefan Wagner, we were using mean field model which is a staple of performance analysis and queuing theory to tackle experimental design problems under interference. And I think the list can go on where such methodologies uh, from one field can really make an impact in different fields. And considering these topics together uh, might make these cross fertilization uh, more easily spotted. Now, the final reason, perhaps the most exciting reason for me personally, is may we discover entirely new insights by adopting this information-centric view, those insights that would have been otherwise obfuscated or not available, we had to consider these segments separately. I don't really have a concrete message here or concrete evidence, but I will say there are already some partial glimpses on how this might look like. And for instance, as part of our work in understanding privacy in allocation, and we actually see a fundamental trade-off between privacy and utilization in the sense that for a policy that maxima, uh, maximally utilizes information or maximally adapts to information available, in some sense, they cannot be at the same time private because by definition, their actions are extremely tuned to the information they have at hand. How to formalize that remains an open question, but I think that could be a very interesting uh, direction to explore. And on the other hand, you can also think about uh, the results we have in future information, which shows that future information, the benefits of that, heavily depends on the traffic load of the system. And more abstractly, the benefit of information in a utilization problem might depend on the stochastic nature of the problem at hand. And this prompts the question of, is the reverse true in information generation? That is, can we say that the resource, uh, resource requirement uh, needed to generate information might depend on some intricate statistical nature of the underlying information process? And here again, I don't have a concrete answer, but seem quite exciting to explore as well. And obviously, there's much more to be discovered. And I welcome your feedback and questions. Thank you very much.